two centuries ago in 1776, uh, there were two books published in England, both of which are read avidly today. One of them was Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, and the other was Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Gibbon's multi-volume work is the tale of a state that survived for 12 centuries in the West and for another thousand years uh, in the East at Constantinople. Yet Gibbon, in looking at this <coughs> phenomenon, commented that the wonder was not that the Roman Empire had fallen, but rather that it had lasted so long. And scholars since Gibbon <coughs> have devoted a great deal of energy to examining that uh, problem. How was it that the Roman Empire lasted so long? Uh, and did it decline, or was it simply transformed into something else? That something else being the uh, European civilization of which we are the heirs. Now, I've been asked to speak on the theme <clears throat> of Roman history, uh, particularly the problem of inflation and its impact. My analysis is based on the premise that monetary policy cannot be studied or understood in isolation from the overall policies of the state. Monetary, fiscal, military, political, economic issues are all very much intertwined. And the reason they are all so intertwined is in part due to the fact that the state, any state, normally seeks to monopolize the supply of money within its own territory. Monetary policy, therefore, always serves, even if it serves badly, the perceived needs of the rulers of the state. If it also happens to enhance the prosperity and progress of the masses of the people, that is a secondary benefit. But its first aim is to serve the needs of the rulers, not the ruled. And this point is central, I believe, to an understanding of the course of monetary policy in the late Roman Empire. We may begin by looking at simply the mentality of the rulers of the Roman Empire, uh, beginning at the end of the second century and looking through to the end of the third century. This period of the third century, Roman historians refer to uh, as the crisis of the third century. And the reason is that uh, the problems of the Roman uh, society in that period were so profound, uh, so uh, enormous, that Roman society uh, emerge from the third century very, very different in almost all ways from uh, what it had been in the first and second centuries, uh, a period the historians speak of as the Augustan Principate. To look at the uh, mentality of the Roman emperors, we can look just at the advice that the emperor Septimius Severus gave to his uh, two sons, Caracalla and Geta. This was supposed to be his final words to his heirs. He said, live in harmony, enrich the troops, ignore everyone else. There's a monetary policy to be marveled at. Caracalla did not adhere to the first part of that. In fact, one of his first acts was to murder his brother. But as for enriching the troops, he took that so seriously to heart that his mother uh, uh, remonstrated with him and urged him to uh, be more moderate and to uh, restrain his increasing military expenditures and his uh, very burdensome uh, new taxes. He responded by saying, uh, there was no longer any revenue, just or unjust, to be found but not to worry. Quote, for as long as we have this, he insisted, pointing to his sword, 
we shall not run short of money. His sense of priorities was made more explicit when he remarked, quote, nobody should have any money but I, so that I may bestow it upon the soldiers. And he was as good as his word. He raised the pay of the soldiers 50 percent. And to achieve this, he doubled the inheritance taxes paid by Roman citizens. When this was not sufficient to meet his needs, he uh, admitted almost every inhabitant of the uh, empire to Roman citizenship. What had formerly been a privilege now became simply a means of expanding the tax base. He then went further <coughs> by proceeding to debase the coinage. Now, the basic coinage of the Roman Empire to this time, we're, we're speaking now uh, about 211, uh, was the silver denarius introduced by Augustus uh, at the end of the uh, first uh, century before Christ. Uh, Augustus had issued a, a silver coin, a denarius, uh, that was about 95% silver. And that coin continued for the better part of two centuries as the basic uh, medium of exchange in the empire. By the time of uh, Trajan in 117, it was only about 85% silver, down from Augustus's 95. By the age of Marcus Aurelius <coughs> in 180, <coughs> excuse me, it was down to about 75% silver. In Septimius's time, it had dropped to 60%, and Caracalla evened it off at 50-50. Caracalla was assassinated in 217, and there then followed a, uh, an age that uh, historians refer to as the age of the Barak emperors, because throughout the third century, all the emperors were soldiers and all of them came to their uh, power by military coups of one sort or another. There were about 26 uh, legitimate emperors uh, in this century, uh, and only one of them died a natural death. The rest were either assassinated or died in battle, which will give you some idea of the change since uh, this was totally unprecedented in Roman uh, history, with two exceptions, Nero a suicide, and uh, Caligula uh, assassinated earlier. Caracalla uh, had also uh, debased uh, the, go the gold coinage. Uh, under Augustus, this circulated at 45 coins to a pound of gold. Uh, Caracalla made it 50 to a pound of gold. Uh, within 20 years after him, it was circulating at 72 to the pound of gold, reduced to 60 at the end of the century by Diocletian, only to be raised again to 72 uh, by Constantine. So even the gold coinage was, in fact, inflated, debased. But the real crisis came uh, after Caracalla uh, between 258 and 275. In a period of intense civil war, and foreign invasions, the uh, emperors simply abandoned for all practical purposes a silver coinage. By 268, there was only five uh, tenths uh, percent silver in the denarius. And prices in this period rose in most parts of the empire by nearly a thousand percent. The only people who were getting paid in gold were the barbarian troops hired by the emperors. The barbarians were so barbarous that they would only accept gold in payment for their services. Now, the situation uh, did not change until the accession of Diocletian in the year 284. Shortly after his accession, he raised the weight of the gold coinage the aureus, uh, to uh, 60 to the pound. This was from a low of uh, 72. But 10 years later, he finally abandoned the silvered uh, coinage, which by this time was simply a, a, a bronze uh, coin uh, dipped in silver rather quickly. Uh, 
and he abandoned that completely and tried to issue a new silver coin, which was struck at 96 coins to the pound of silver, called the Argenteus. This Argenteus was fixed as equal to 50 of the old denarii, the old coinage. It was designed to respond to the need for higher tariffed coins in the marketplace to reflect the inflation. He also issued a new bronze coin, tariffed at 10 denarii, called the Numus. But less than a decade later, that silver coin had gone from being tariffed at 10 of the, 50 of the old, to now equaling 100 of the old. And the bronze coinage from 10 denarii to 20, in other words, 100% inflation. In other words, despite his efforts, Diocletian had not been able to stop the inflation. The next emperor who interfered with the coinage in a meaningful way was to be Constantine, the first Christian emperor of Rome. Constantine, in the year 312, which is also the year he issued the Edict of Toleration for Christianity, issued a new gold piece, which he called by a new name, the Solidus, solid gold. This was struck at 72 to the pound, so it was, in fact, debased over Diocletian's. These were very large issues, and historians have puzzled over where he got all the gold, but I think the puzzle uh, is not so much of a real puzzle once you begin to look at the legislation that took place. First of all, he issued two new taxes. One was taxed on the uh, estates of the senators, and this was rather new because senators generally uh, were free of most uh, taxes on their land. He also issued a tax on the capital of merchants, not their earnings, but their capital. And this was to be uh, levied every five years, and it was to be paid in gold. He also required that the rents from the uh, imperial estates, which were rented out to tenants, were to be paid only in gold. He took on the bullion reserves of his former partner Licinius, uh, who had extracted by force bullion from the treasuries of the cities of the Eastern Empire. In other words, any city that had any gold bullion or silver bullion left in its treasury, uh, th this was simply requisitioned by Licinius, and this passed on now into the hands of uh, Constantine, who had uh, gotten rid of Licinius in a civil war. We're also told that he stripped the pagan temples of their treasuries. Uh, this he did rather late in his reign, uh, still uh, somewhat afraid of, apparently in the early days, of uh, angering the gods of Rome. As his Christianity became more fixed, he felt greater ease at robbing the temples. Now, Constantine's reform, in one sense, began the reversal of the process. The gold coinage was sufficiently large that it began to take hold and to become uh, circulate more freely. Uh, the silver coinage uh, failed, and what was worse, at no time in this period did the central government try to control the token coinage. And the result of that was token coinage was being minted uh, not only by the imperial mints, but also by the mints of cities. In other words, if a city couldn't pay uh, its costs, pay its salaries to its employees, it simply uh, struck up some token coinage and issued that. Uh, by the late third century, we also begin to have massive appearance of what numismatists call counterfeits. Uh, I would say it would be called uh, credit money today. Uh, people need small change, and they simply go and manufacture it. All of which, of course, means that the amount of uh, token coinage in circulation is uncontrolled and increasingly massive. Now, one of the things that had happened in the course of this third century inflation was that the government found that when it paid its troops, 
in token coinage or even in these uh, debased silver coins, uh, prices immediately rose uh, every time the uh, silver value of the denarius dropped, prices naturally rose, and uh, the result of this was the government, in order to try to protect its civil servants and its soldiers from the effects of inflation, it began to demand payment of taxes in kind and services rather than in coin. Uh, they wound up, in effect, in repudiating their own issues, not accepting them for tax collection purposes. Uh, with Constantine's reform, uh, this situation changed somewhat, and slowly but surely, uh, the government began to uh, move away from collecting taxes in kind and from paying salaries in kind and began to substitute uh, paying salaries in gold and collecting taxes in gold. Over the long run, this meant that the gold standard uh, was strengthened, and gold remained the real uh, money of the uh, Roman Empire. However, uh, the inflation did not uh, end for the masses of the people. In other words, gold was a hedge uh, against inflation for those who had it, and these were principally the troops and the civil servants the taxpayers had to buy these gold coins in order to uh, pay their taxes. And so if they were wealthy enough, they could afford to buy these uh, gold coins, which were increasingly expensive in, in terms of token money. If they were poorer, they simply couldn't pay the taxes, and this meant they lost their lands in one form or another or became delinquents. And we, we hear constant references to people uh, abandoning their land, disappearing. As a matter of fact, in the third century, uh, this was a constant problem in Rome, uh, that all sorts of people were trying to escape the increased taxes that the military uh, had uh, uh, needed. Um, the army itself, from the time of Augustus, when they had about uh, a quarter of a million troops. By the time of Diocletian, they had uh, somewhat over 600,000. So the army itself had doubled in size in the course of this inflationary spiral, and obviously that contributed greatly to the inflation. In addition, the administration of the state had grown enormously. The, um, uh, under Augustus, essentially, uh, you had the imperial administration at Rome and the governors of different provinces, a secondary level of administration, and then the primary governmental units in the uh, Roman Empire in this time were the cities, the municipalities. By the time of Diocletian, uh, this pattern had been uh, broken apart. Uh, you had not one emperor, but you had, under Diocletian, four emperors which meant four imperial courts, four praetorian guards, four palaces, four staffs, etc., etc. Under them were four praetorian prefectures, regional uh, administrative units with their staffs and their budgets. Under these four prefectures, there were then, uh, the, they were divided into 12 dioceses, each diocese having its administrative staff and so on. Under the diocesan rulers, the vicars of the diocese, we have the provinces. In Augustus's time, there were uh, approximately 20 provinces. 300 years later, with no substantial increase in territory, there were over 100 provinces. They had simply began to divide and subdivide provinces uh, for purposes of maintaining internal uh, military control of these regions. In other words, the, the cost of policing the Roman state became increasingly enormous. Uh, all these costs, then, are some of the reasons why uh, the inflation uh, took place. I'll get to others in a moment. To give you some idea of the uh, situation after Constantine's reform of the gold, uh, let me just 
briefly give you the figures for what it cost in terms of the uh, silver coinage and the, or token coinage now, the denarius, uh, for a pound of gold. In Diocletian's time, in the year 301, he fixed the price at uh, 50,000 denarii for one pound of gold. Ten years later, it had risen to 120,000. In 324, in other words, 23 years after the, it was 50, it was now 300,000. And in 337, the year of Constantine's uh, death, uh, a pound of gold brought 20 million denarii. Um, and by the way, just as we're all familiar with the German currency of the 20s with the uh, figures stamped on it, the Roman coinage also has stamps and overstamps uh, on the metal indicating multiples of value. Uh, at one point, one of the Roman emperors had a marvelous idea. Instead of issuing a single coin, he, in, he, he devised a method to handle the inflation. He took uh, uh, brass slugs and put them in a leather pouch and called it a follis. And people began passing these pouches back and forth as, as, as uh, value. I guess it was the, the Roman equivalent to those baskets of, of uh, paper we see in the pictures of Germany in the 20s. Uh, interestingly enough, within 10 years or so after that began, uh, the word follis, which had meant this, this bag of coins, had now drifted to mean one of those plugs uh, one of those slugs was now the follis. Uh, so it, 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 they couldn't even keep the bags uh, stable. They, they, they too were inflated. Now, one interesting thing with all this uh, inflation, I think it should be a great comfort to us. Historians of prices in the Roman Empire have come to the conclusion that despite all of this inflation, or perhaps we should say because of all this inflation, the price of gold, in terms of its purchasing power, remained stable from the first through the fourth century. In other words, gold remained, in terms of its purchasing power, uh, a stable value, whereas all this coinage just became uh, increasingly worthless. Now, what were the causes of this inflation? First of all, war. The soldiers' pay rose from 225 denarii during the time of Augustus to 300 uh, denarii in the time of Domitian, about 100 years later. A century after Domitian, in the time of Septimius, it had gone from 300 to 500 denarii. And in the time of Caracalla, about 10 years later, uh, it had gone to 750 denarii. In other words, uh, the cost of the army was also rising in terms of the coinage. So as the coinage became more worthless, the cost of the army had to be increased. The advance in the soldiers' pay in the rest of the third century and into the fourth century is not known. We don't have figures. And one reason is that the soldiers were increasingly paid in terms of, of requisitions of supplies, uh, and uh, goods in kind. They were literally given food, clothing, shelter, and other uh, commodities uh, in lieu of pay. And this applied also to the civil service. When one Roman emperor refused to pay a donative on his accession, this was a, a, a bonus given to the soldiers on the accession of the emperor, uh, he was simply uh, murdered by his troops. Uh, the Romans... Uh, had had this kind of problem even in the days of the Republic. If the soldiers don't get paid, they rather re resent it. What we find is that the donatives had been given on the accession of a new emperor in the time of, from the time of Augustus on. Uh, then they began to be given in the third century every five years. By the time of Diocletian, donatives were given every year so that the soldiers' donatives had in fact become their part of their basic salary. The size of the army, I think I indicated already, had increased, uh, doubled from the time of Augustus to Diocletian, and the size of the civil service I indicated also. Now, all these events, 
strain the fiscal resources of the state beyond its ability to sustain itself. And uh, the debasement uh, and the taxation were both used to keep the ship of state going, uh, frequently by debasing, then by uh, taxation, and then often simply by accusing people of treason and confiscating their estates. Um, one of the Christian fathers, St. Gregory uh, Nazianzus, uh, commented that war is the mother of taxes. And I think that's a wonderful thing to keep in mind. War is the mother of taxes. And it's also, of course, the mother of inflation. Now, what were the consequences of inflation? Uh, one of the odd things about inflation is, in the Roman Empire, that while uh, the Roman state survived, the Roman state was not destroyed by inflation. What was destroyed by inflation was the freedom of the Roman people. And particularly, the first victim was their economic freedom. Rome had basically a uh, laissez-faire concept uh, of uh, state uh, economy relations. Except in emergencies, which were usually related to war, uh, the Roman government generally followed a policy of uh, free trade and uh, minimal restriction on the economic activities of its population. But now, under the pressure of this uh, need to pay the troops and under the pressure of inflation, the liberty of the people began to be seriously eroded, and very rapidly. Uh, we could start with the class known as the decuriones, the decurions. This was your prosperous, small, and middle landowning class who were the dominant elements of the cities of the Roman Empire. They were the class from which were chosen the, the, uh, the municipal councils, the municipal magistrates, uh, and officials. And traditionally, they had viewed uh, service in the governments of their towns as an honor. And they had responded to this by uh, donating uh, not merely their time, but their wealth to the uh, betterment of the urban environment building stadiums and bathhouses and repairing the streets and providing for pure water. These were considered benefactions. It was a, it was a kind of philanthropic uh, element. And their reward was, of course, public recognition and esteem. This class in the mid-third century was assigned a task of collecting the taxes in the municipality that were being assessed by the central government. The central government could no longer collect its taxes effectively, so they made the decurion class collectively responsible for getting revenues and passing them on to the imperial government. Uh, the decurions, of course, had as much difficulty as anyone else in doing this, and uh, the returns were, again, frequently inadequate, so the government solved that problem by simply passing a law that any taxes the decurions could not collect from others, they would have to pay out of their own pocket. That's known as the incentive method for the tax collector. Uh, as you can well imagine, as the crisis became greater and the economy was disrupted by civil conflicts and invasions and the effects of uh, inflation, uh, the decurions, uh, strangely enough, no longer wanted to be decurions. And uh, they began to abandon their lands, abandon their cities, and escape to wherever they could find refuge in other larger cities or other provinces. Uh, but they were not to be allowed to do that with impunity, and the law was then passed that any decurion discovered somewhere else was to be uh, arrested, uh, bound like a slave, and carted back to his hometown where he was restored to his dignity as a decurion. Uh, it, this is, third century is also the period of the persecution of the church. And we find that uh, at least some of the emperors uh, must have had a sense of humor because uh, 
when uh, they passed a regulation that if a Christian was arrested and found guilty of capital punishment, namely believing in Christ, uh, he was to uh, not be executed, but offered the option of becoming a decurion. <laughs> now, the merchants and the artisans were uh, traditionally organized into guilds and chambers of commerce and that sort of thing. They now, too, came under government pressure because the government could not uh, obtain enough material for the war machine through regular uh, channels. People, after all, don't want all that uh, token coinage. And so they were now compelled to make deliveries of goods so that if you had a factory making garments, you now had to deliver so many garments to the government requisitions. Uh, if you had uh, ships, you had to carry government goods in your ships. In other words, what we have here is a kind of nationalization of private uh, enterprises. And this nationalization uh, means that uh, the people who risk their money and their talent uh, are, are compelled to now serve the state whether they like it or not. When people tried to get out of this, they were then, uh, by law, compelled to remain in the occupation that they were in. In other words, you couldn't change your job or your business. Uh, this was not sufficient because, after all, death is always a relief from taxes. Uh, and so the occupations were now made hereditary. When you died, your son had to take up your business, your trade, your profession. If, he, if he was, your father was a shoemaker, you had to be a shoemaker. These started by being uh, uh, restricted to the defense-oriented industries. But, of course, gradually it was realized that everything is defense-oriented and the system just developed. The peasantry, uh, known as the uh, uh, colony, uh, these were leaseholders on uh, both imperial and private estates, they, too, formerly a free class, were now uh, under the same kinds of pressures that all smallholders were in this uh, situation. And they began to drift away trying to find better opportunities, better lease, leases, better occupations. And so, uh, under Diocletian, the colony were now bound to the soil. Anyone who had a lease on a particular piece of land could not give that lease up. More than that, they had to stay on the land and work it. In effect, this is the beginning of what in the Middle Ages is called serfdom. But it, it actually has its origins here in the late Roman society. Uh, we know, for example, from uh, studies of, the, uh, of Palestine, uh, particularly in the uh, uh, rabbinical writings, that in the course of the third and early fourth century, the structure of land holding in Palestine changed very dramatically. Uh, Palestine in the second century was largely composed of small peasant landholders with very small acreage, perhaps an average of two and a half acres. By the fourth century, those smallholders had virtually disappeared and been replaced by vast uh, estates controlled by uh, a few large landowners. The peasants working the estates were the same people, but they had in the meantime lost their land to uh, the, the, the larger landowners. In other words, uh, land holding became a massive kind of agribusiness. Uh, in this course of this, the population of Palestine, still principally Jewish, uh, also changed in that the ownership of land passed from Jews to Gentiles. And the reason for that undoubtedly was that the only people with large amounts of cash who could buy out the smallholders who were in distress were, of course, the government officials. And we, we hear of them being called potentes, powerful ones. In effect, uh, there's a shift in the distribution of wealth uh, in Palestine and obviously, this, uh, from, from other evidence, uh, similar things were happening uh, in other places. With regard to taxes, uh, 
they naturally increased across the board. But Diocletian decided that it was a very inefficient system that he had inherited. Every province more or less had its own system of taxation going back to pre-Roman times, actually. And so he, with his military uh, mind, demanded standardization. And what he did was to have all uh, wealth, which was, of course, landed wealth, uh, assessed in units of productivity. In other words, uh, every person who had land was either uh, singly, if he was a large landowner, fit into a particular uh, unit, a tax unit called a yugum. And those who were smaller landowners were collectively put into a yugum. And this meant that the emperor, for the first time, had the basis of a national budget, something the Romans never had until Diocletian. And therefore, he knew at any given time how many taxable units of wealth there were in, every, in any province, and he could simply levy an assessment and expect to get a, bit, uh, a fixed uh, amount of money. Unfortunately, this took no account of the fact that in agriculture, productivity varies considerably from season to season, and that if an army has passed through your district, it may take years to recover. Uh, the result is we hear of massive petitions from whole regions asking the emperor to forgive them their taxes, to remit five years of past dues, uh, and so on and so forth, or to reduce the number of units of productivity to reflect the loss of population or the loss of materials. As a matter of fact, when people began to say, uh, it used to be I had five people paying this unit of taxation, but two of them have fled and there's only, you know, uh, half the land in production, uh, the response of the government was to say, that doesn't matter. You still have to pay for the land that is now out of production. So, I mean, th there's no relationship between taxes and actual productivity. How did people protect themselves from this? Well, first of all, mortgages uh, virtually uh, ceased, long-term mortgages virtually ceased to be given. Uh, long-term loans of any kind uh, disappear. Uh, no one will lend unless they are guaranteed payment in gold or silver bullion. In fact, the government itself, under Diocletian and Constantine, refused to accept gold coins in payment of taxes, but insisted instead on gold bullion, so that the coins that you bought in the marketplace had to then be melted down and presented in the form of bullion. And the reason was the government was never sure how adulterated its own gold coinage really was. So they insisted on bullion. Pledges and securities for crops and for loans were always uh, in uh, either uh, gold, silver, or indeed in crops themselves. In Egypt, we have a document in which the banks have been refusing to accept coins with the divine image of the emperor. In other words, state issues. Uh, the government's reaction to that, of course, was to force the banks to accept uh, the coinage. This led to wholesale corruption in Roman society uh, as the black market became a normal part as people uh, refused to pass, uh, to exchange coinage at the officially fixed uh, tariffs, but instead coinage uh, uh, was passed on a market principle. There were obviously flight from the land, massive evasion of taxes. Uh, people left their jobs, they left their homes, they left their social status. <clears throat> now, Diocletian's uh, final contribution to this continuing disaster uh, was to issue his famous Edict on Prices. And the Edict on Prices of 301, a very famous uh, uh, instance of a massive effort by the government to control inflation by uh, price controls. You have to realize that there were a little, there's a little problem. <laughs> uh, the Roman Empire uh, was a vast region running from Britain in the west to Iraq, Mesopotamia in the east, from the Rhine and the Danube to the Sahara. It included areas of very sophisticated 
and very primitive economies. And the result of that was the cost of living varied considerably from province to province. Egypt seems to have had the lowest cost of living. Uh, Palestine had a cost of living twice that of Egypt, and Rome had a cost of living twice, uh, Rome and Italy, and uh, had uh, a cost of living twice that of uh, Palestine. Uh, Diocletian ignored that. He just issued a single standard price for the entire empire. The result was that in Egypt, the effects of the edict probably uh, didn't exist because the price, uh, the maximum price fixed in the edict uh, was very rarely reached in Egypt. But it was the, 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 uh, the people in Rome, of course, had the, pri the maximum price lower than the market price. Okay. Now, the result of that, of course, was riots in the street, disappearance of goods. Uh, the penalty for violating the uh, law was death, very common penalty in Rome for almost anything. And the, the mentality of Diocletian comes out, and the cause of the price, uh, the uh, maximum price edict, comes out in the preface to the law. I'll just quote briefly uh, some of it. When you hear these first uh, words, I, I'd like you to pay attention because you, you, may, you may have a different interpretation of them than Diocletian meant. He says, if the excesses perpetrated by persons of unlimited and frenzied avarice could be checked. He doesn't mean himself. <laughs> if the general welfare could endure without harm this riotous license. If these uncontrolled madmen the unscrupulous, the immoderate, the avaricious could be persuaded to desist from plundering the wealth of all, then all would be well. Now, who are these people? They are the merchants. They are the avaricious, greedy types uh, who cause inflation, as we all know. Uh, then he speaks about himself and his four partners, his three partners. Human race. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We are agreed that decisive legislation is necessary so that the long hoped for solutions which mankind itself could not provide. You know, it's, it's the same stuff. <laughs> we, can't, we can't do anything ourselves. We, we need the, the legislator. <clears throat> by the remedies provided by our foresight, These things may be remedied uh, for the general betterment of all. In fact, as you read through the rest of the thing, it becomes clear that the reason there, the uh, edict on prices was issued, prices and wages was issued, <clears throat> was that the soldiers were the principal victims of the inflation and that Diocletian was afraid he was losing control of his army. And so uh, the people who are uh, to be protected are the soldiers and the other servants of the state. Now, Diocletian's monetary reforms were tentative steps in the right direction, except for the edict on prices, which, by the way, uh, simply didn't work and was uh, gradually dropped. But his steps were not radical enough. His inability to create a sufficient supply of gold and silver coinage, combined, combined with his continued reliance on payments in kind for taxes and salaries, and the continued uh, issuance of fiat bronze coinage in endless amounts, failed to make a significant dent in the problem. Constantine's reforms were also partial, but of sufficient vigor and radical character to make a difference. Through his willingness to extract by compulsion the gold reserves of the taxpayers, forcing them to disgorge their bullion, he placed an ever-increasing supply of gold in the hands of the government officials. This was increasingly used to pay military bonuses, salaries for bureaucrats, and even payments for certain public works. Increasingly then, a two-tier monetary system emerged in which the government, the soldiers, and the bureaucrats 
enjoyed the benefits of a gold standard, while the non-governmental portion of the economy continued to struggle with a rapidly uh, inflating fiat currency. The new gold solidus uh, circulated widely by uh, its possessors, the government salaried employees, sold at various market uh, rates to customers who desperately needed it to pay their taxes. Thus, the state had found a way to protect itself and its servants from the unwholesome effects of its own earlier inflationary uh, cycle, while slowly withdrawing itself from the cumbersome and wasteful system of accepting taxes and paying salaries in kind. Meanwhile, the masses suffered from massive injection of fiat money, which they had to accept in payment for government requisitions of such gold or silver or other commodities which the government demanded. Now, we may wish to find some lessons in this tale of uh, monetary policies of the late Roman Empire. The first lesson, I think, must be that if war uh, is the health of the state, as Rand Randolph Bourne said, uh, it is poison to a stable and sound money. The Roman monetary crisis, therefore, was uh, closely connected with the Roman uh, military problem. Another lesson is that the problems become solvable when a ruler decides that something can be done and must be done. Diocletian and Constantine clearly were willing to act to protect their own ruling class interests the military, and the civil service. Monetary reforms uh, were necessary to win the support of the troops and the bureaucrats that composed the only real constituency of the Roman state. And the two-tier system was designed to this end. It, bought, it brought about a stable monetary standard for the ruling group and did not hesitate to secure it, who did not hesitate to secure it at the expense of the mass of the population. <clears throat> now, the Roman state <clears throat> survived. The liberty of the Roman people did not. Uh, when freedom became possible in the West in the 5th century with the barbarian invasions, people took advantage of the possibility of change. The tax burden remained burdensome even after the gold standard was reestablished. <clears throat> the peasantry had become totally uh, alienated from the uh, Roman state because it was no longer free. The business community, likewise, was no longer free, and the middle class of the urban cities was no longer free. Now, the economy of the West was perhaps more fatally weakened than that of the East, and when we read in the uh, writings of the late, uh, of the early 5th century Christian priest Salvian of Marseille, his account of why the Roman state was collapsing in the West, he was writing from France, Gaul, uh, Salvian says that the Roman state is collapsing because it deserved to collapse, because it had denied the first premise of good government, which was justice to the people. And by justice, he meant a just system of taxation. Uh, Salvian tells us, and I don't think he's exaggerating, that one of the reasons why the Roman state collapsed in the 5th century was that the Roman people, the mass of the population, had but one wish after being captured by the barbarians, that they would never again fall under the rule of the Roman bureaucracy. In other words, the Roman state was the enemy. The barbarians were the liberators. And this undoubtedly was due to the inflation of the third century. While the state had solved the monetary problem for its own constituents, it had failed to solve that monetary problem for the masses. And 
continue to use an oppressive system of taxation in order to fill the coffers of the ruling bureaucrats and military. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. That was most interesting and informative. We'd be happy to entertain any questions or comments. I'd just like to make one comment. We like to think of ourselves, obviously, here in the 20th century as a very advanced society. I think technologically it's clear that we are. But isn't it interesting that in the midst of wars, taxes, inflation, government edicts to the contrary, that 1,600 years ago people chose gold as their money? I wonder what it might say about us that we have it. Any questions or comments? I think the other important message that, that Professor Peden has delivered to us is this notion that the inflation government creates in an attempt to curb it often results in a severe curtailment of our own economic freedoms. So the next time you hear the argument that, well, maybe a little bit of inflation is a good thing for a society, and that it might improve business conditions and things like that, argue to the analyst that, well, it's going to take away our economic freedoms eventually. Yes, we have a question back here. Hello. Uh, in today's economy, we make the uh, connection between government debt and uh, inflation. Is there any evidence that uh, the Roman government had access to um, uh, borrowing and debt? Uh, it's amazing, but the Roman government does not seem to have had any kind of uh, uh, credit system that it could rely on. Uh, in other words, it, it, it uh, did not normally go out and borrow money. Uh, when Marcus Aurelius, for example, needed funds to pursue his wars in the second century, he had to go out and sell the uh, imperial jewels to raise the funds. Uh, this was why they turned to inflation. Uh, they, they didn't have a system of uh, government, you know, treasury bonds and things like that. It just didn't exist. I haven't seen uh, on the program there's any one particular uh, time that we're going to talk about proposals from where we go from here, about how do we get from where, where we are to some kind of more stable money. And I just wondered if you have any ideas from historical perspective uh, what you think the United States should be doing from here on out and what transition steps we should take and what kind of eventual gold standard or we should be having? Well, I'm not, a, I'm not a, uh, an economist, so I couldn't go into the technical uh, ends of it, but uh, let me speak to at least the political problem. Um, inflation is not uh, an act of God. It is an act of uh, men, specific men, who uh, foster it for their own particular ends. And therefore, it seems to me the first step before we can be effective in uh, uh, devising an anti-inflationary policy is to clearly identify who actually is profiting from this system and who is not. Um, it is naive to think that, you know, that no one profits from inflation. Certain people do. Uh, clearly, with the credit system of the United States government, uh, the government itself, uh, I would think, could not possibly allow any serious deflation because its own public debt would have to be repudiated. And so, I mean, one of our basic problems is that the United States government is itself the largest obstacle to a, uh, a uh, non-inflationary uh, policy. And the economists may have more to say about that. But I think the political question is, who profits from this? So if we can identify those people, then we, it seems to me, then we can move ahead and find a political strategy to identify those people and identify those who are being hurt. And uh, that would be my first step. But, but I think that assumes an intelligence on the part of those people that isn't there. I don't think that there's a grand conspiracy to create inflation and then profit from it. I think many of these people really think that they're doing something for the good of society and are simply misguided. 
Well, I think then we have to win. They are not creating inflation on purpose so that they can profit. Yeah. They honestly believe that they are doing the right thing for society. Well, it may be a little more complicated now because uh, I think uh, I think most people know that if there's less silver in a quarter now than there was 20 years ago, something's wrong. Okay. These are. I mean, I've never I've never seen anyone do this as well as Ron Paul, and he 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 shows people very graphically in his speeches that I've seen. Uh, and you don't have to be a college graduate to understand that. You know? In fact, he told me that some of the most ardent uh, hard money people in Texas are taxi drivers. <laughs> so uh, I, I, don't think the, I don't think the problem of educating the mass of the public is very difficult. I think the, the, uh, the uh, problem of educating our leaders our elites is more difficult. Uh, bec- but I think the reason for that is so many of our elites profit from the system. I, I, I mean, you're, you're assuming they're just naive, but I notice they're naive in their own self-interest. Yeah. <laughs> we have time for one more question. <clears throat> I know you, that you could uh, spend the whole weekend giving us more examples of this material and we would, I think, very much profit by going back to the ancient world and seeing that there was a whole cycle from of prosperity to decline based on, uh, on bad, bad monetary ideas coming out of the state. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions that would, I think, illuminate some of one or two points. Uh, the uh, ancient world, Mediterranean world, was dominated by big imperial bureaucracies, big military bureaucracies. And when we get to the period where there is a transition where the ordinary uh, property owners lose their property to the large property owners, and this occurred at this time, but it had occurred at earlier points, uh, I think it's important to relate that to your point about the state turning the large property owners into their tax collectors. And so each, in each stage, whether it's under the Basileus of the, of the Persian Empire or under the uh, Hellenistic successor states of Alexander, or and then the Roman Empire as the successor of the Persian and uh, Hellenistic Empire, in each case, the large property owners are, are, are made the tax collectors. They're identifiable. They have wealth. And the government says, if you don't collect it from the others, you're going to have to cough it up. And then... The consequence of that is that the rich become the tax collectors when the, when the ordinary property owner can't pay, the rich man gets his property in order to pay the state. And the result is in the biblical writings, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the fathers of the church, where you see a tax on the rich, what they're attacking isn't the rich, it's the tax collector who has be, who's rich because he's benefited from being a tax collector. And the modern uh, contemporary liberation theology going back to the biblical writings and to the fathers of the church and finding passages where they're saying, you rich, you have done this to the poor. The poor are poor because they were taxed out of their wealth and the rich are rich because they're state employees. It's not because of wealth. It's not because of productivity. It's because they are state, part of the state apparatus who have benefited from that. And the fathers of the church and the prophets are not attacking the wealthy, they're attacking the tax collectors and the state for expropriating the property holders. The, the, the this is, property this is, is, a, is a positive thing in the fathers and in the prophets. Being it, what's being attacked is the state. The wealthy are the people who have expropriated the property holders by using state power. Yes. Uh, probably the, uh, the most graphic description of that process that you've so well described, uh, is in uh, Salvian of Marseille, this early 5th century uh, uh, Catholic priest from uh, southern Gaul. And um, in there, uh, he, he makes the point. What had happened already some, some earlier, uh, almost a century earlier, was that the government had, uh, instead of collecting taxes directly, uh, had given to the large lo- local landlords the ability to collect taxes from the other people in the district. 
They felt that they'd have one man on the scene that they could hold responsible rather than chasing peasants through the woods. Uh, but that didn't work out quite as they thought because these large landowners uh, then used their tax, as you suggest, their tax holding, uh, their tax collecting power to, to compel the smallholders to surrender their lands to the large landowners who said, you know, just surrender your land to me. You can have it on a cheap lease from me and I will take care of the taxes. OK, well, of course, what happened eventually was that uh, he, he took care of the taxes by collecting it from the, the, the tenants uh, and giving to the state less than he collected. Or not giving anything to the state because he was a powerful political figure and who's going to you know, challenge his uh, tax collecting. Uh, so what, what Salvian does is he describes this whole system and he makes the point you're making that uh, the, the, uh, the landlords are not just landlords, they're powerful political figures. They, they control the courts of law, the police force, and the tax collecting. And they themselves are not paying taxes because of their political position. And in effect, what's happening is the uh, bureaucracy, in its desire to get more money, had undermined itself by creating, uh, in the, in the, um, out in the rural areas, uh, a large number of people who had who began to take on the powers of the state themselves. Some people see in this the first foreshadowings of the dispersion of the feudal system. But it, S Salvian's work is called the uh, governance of God, and he tries to explain why the Romans deserve to lose their empire from a Christian perspective. Uh, you look over the hi this history, it's pretty dismal history. It keeps on going down, down, down to dark ages. And, uh, you know, I'm always hearing sto people talking about how the United States is following the trend and that kind of thing. And I'm just wondering, wh uh, uh, I, I don't think the analogies are all there. Uh, were there any records or do you know of any ideological movements uh, such as like the Mises Institute or any of the freedom movement uh, any time during that period? And what was, if there were, what yeah. was going on? Well, we, we know... Uh, uh, Lactantius, for example, a Christian writer uh, at the time of uh, Diocletian, uh, whom he wrote a, a book called On the uh, Death of the Persecutors. And Diocletian was the last great persecutor of the Christians. And he opens up a comment on Diocletian by saying, Diocletian, an inventive criminal. And he goes on to uh, show what, what terrible things Diocletian did that uh, he, all he had to do was see a beautifully kept estate and he would have the person who owned it uh, condemned to death on some trumped up charge and confiscate it. Uh, now, he may exaggerate a bit. He sounds like an old fashioned Taft Republican at times. Uh, but he uh, his uh, his his uh, description of the situation is pretty accurate. And so I would say some of the church fathers were perfectly aware of the inequities of the system. Um, there were also people who opposed the government and its collection of taxes. There were constant, uh, almost all the time, uh, revolts of the peasantry. And I mean, people revolt in different ways. Some of them flee. Others revolt and kill the tax collector. Others try to escape by turning their land over to someone else and let him worry about paying the taxes. They'll just work as a serf and live their life as quietly as they can. But in uh, Gaul and Spain, you also had another phenomenon, uh, widespread peasant rebellions. There was a group called the Bogodai, and uh, they're uniformly described as terrorists. And uh, it turns out that the people they terrorized were the Roman tax collectors. And, and large parts of Gaul in the 3rd and 4th century, and then, of course, in the 5th century, uh, for long periods of time, 25, 30 years, there were parts of Gaul that couldn't be visited by a Roman official because of the uh, peasants' uprising. Was the situation different in the Eastern Empire where the Byzantine Empire didn't really experience the Dark Ages that continued to, to thrive? Uh, the difference probably lies in the fact that the uh, economy of the Eastern uh, Empire was, on the whole, uh, more well-developed uh, greater resources, uh, greater technological skills, 
and uh, much greater uh, agricultural wealth, heavier population. And so strategically, they were in better shape. And then uh, they also did not experience something else. The barbarian invasions tended to be to move in the West. And so the people had no opportunity really to to perform the way the Western peasantry did, which was to vote with their feet by joining the barbarians. It's very interesting that in Egypt and Syria, as soon as a liberator or potential liberator arrived, which was in the seventh century, when the Arabs swept out of the desert into Egypt, Syria, Palestine, those provinces went over like that to the Arabs. They opened the gates of the city and said, in effect, rather the Arabs than Constantinople and the tax collectors. So it was, it was a delay of two centuries, but when the opportunity presented itself, they took advantage of it. Joe, thank you very much for an interesting and informative discussion. I'm, I think I'll just break it off here for a moment. Um, we've touched on a number of themes thus far this morning that are most interesting, and I'd like to continue the questioning for just a few more minutes, and then we'll take a short coffee break. Um, we'll just cut our break by a little bit so we can keep going with the questions for now. The number of themes we're touching on you'll hear repeated, throughout the rest of the day. So if we don't get time to discuss everything in depth right now, I hopefully we will by the end of the day. So let's continue with the question. Gentlemen over here. Uh, has any civilization ever recovered from the devaluation of the currency uh, once we have mm -hmm. uh, Well, the, uh, the Roman Empire recovered uh, because the long-term effect of the uh, remonetization of gold under Constantine and his successors. I, I didn't go into that, but by the end of the fourth century, um, the bronze coinage slowly began to be called in and reduced. That was the inflated co coinage. And uh, it was replaced uh, not only by increasing issues of the Salidas, but also by fractional gold coinage, which meant that by the end of the fourth and by the beginning of the fifth century, there was now a gold coinage that could be used in the daily market purchases of people. And uh, so in a sense, uh, as, the, as the bronze coinage declined, okay, for example, in the early 5th century, uh, a pound of gold was circulating at about 6,000 denarii from like 12,000 uh, 20 years before, 10 years before. So there was a gradual lessening of the inflation. And uh, ultimately, the bronze issues ceased, and Rome went back on a, uh, a full gold with an occasional silver issue, and the bronze coinage disappeared. Now, that gold coinage, the Salidas, begun by Constantine, uh, in other words, over a, a century later, had more or less become the standard coin in the market transactions. And that coinage maintained itself at the same uh, level of purity and weight uh, until the middle of the 11th century, which is one of the longest, I would think, uh, cases of a gold maintaining itself, uh, you know, without debasement. And that then led to the survival of the Roman state in the East, because it lasted until... Uh, well, the 11th, uh, 11th century, and then it lasted, technically speaking, till the 15th century. So I think the, the, there's no question that the, that the long-term effect of going back to a plentiful gold coinage and dropping the inflationary coinage, removing it from circulation, was to greatly strengthen the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire of the Middle Ages. Their situation was compounded by loaning unbelievable sums to the third world countries. <laughs> Well, um, in a, an odd sort of way, they did, uh, because what happened was in the, one of the characteristic features of the Roman government of the Middle Ages was that rather than fight wars, it used to pay off the barbarians. They sent them tribute in gold. Now, what was a barbarian to do with gold except buy Roman goods? Okay, so that in that sense, it cost them less to ship them gold uh, to the barbarians than it would if they had to actually fight the barbarians. It was uh, now, of course, they, they're constantly criticized as being, uh, you know, wimps and weaklings. Uh, they didn't defend themselves. 
But I think they really did. They took the cheapest form of defense, which was to kind of deflect the invaders. I might add that there have been a number of other examples where societies have uh, survived highly inflationary conditions. And increasingly what we as economists are seeing in such societies is that it required complete overhaul of their monetary and fiscal arrangements. Um, whether we'll get to that point in the United States obviously remains to be seen. Do we have a question over here earlier? I think I... Yes, um, I'll get to you in just a second. Was there any role of a Roman welfare state as we have today? Uh, sometimes we hear in traditional textbooks that the Roman emperors brought off as into the grand persecution and so forth. Now, I was wondering if this play had a significant role in the play. Uh, yes. Uh, the, um, <laughs> Uh, there was always uh, uh, 150 to 200,000 people in Rome itself who were on the dole. And when Constantine uh, built a new capital, which was tremendously expensive, he uh, also added a dole in Constantinople of about 80,000 people. Uh, this is early in the 4th century. And then other cities said, well, why can't we? We're big cities, too. Why can't we have a dole? So they gave it to Alexandria and Antioch and Carthage. So that, yeah, the, those doles were always there, and the breads and circuses were there, and uh, massive buildings. In fact, uh, one person has commented, I think it was uh, 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 Spengler, Oswald Spengler, said that uh, the winter of a civilization is always marked by the massiveness of its buildings. Okay, And that's certainly true for the late Roman Empire. The most massive buildings were erected uh, in the time of uh, Constantine. He built St. Peter's. He built St. John Lateran in Rome. He built the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. I mean, those are just the most noteworthy ones. And uh, other vast building projects. Diocletian was even worse. He, I mean, he didn't build churches, but he, he built other things. So they, and, and these were often welfare-related things. They provide employment for people and so on. So much of our political rhetoric today is uh, trying to to get this notion of a, of a global ideological struggle between capitalism and communism to be the underpinning for our continuance as a as a warfare state. Everything around the world, any any situation, any conflict, always the bottom line is always looked at by the politicians in terms of well, it's us versus them. I just wonder if the the Roman propaganda mill uh, during the period that you talked about had a similar conception in terms of justifying the increases in military spending in terms of, well, it's either us versus them. Uh, if they don't get us, then if, um, we don't get them, they'll get us. Did they, did they use that type of propaganda to justify the increase in military spending? Uh, they used the coinage itself for uh, propaganda. And there's an interesting kind of change that took place on one issue of coinage. There had been a a coinage that was issued in which they had a personification of abundance. And this uh, god or goddess of abundance was uh, depicted pouring out her horn of plenty on a civilian. Um, in the third century, this suddenly changed and the civilian became a soldier. In other words, abundance was still worship, but she was going to the soldiers, not to the civilians anymore. It's kind of a change. As I say, it's kind of a mental change that takes place. Uh, there were uh, ideological reasons uh, for, for fighting the barbarians. Uh, the Romans had always been ethnocentric, following the Greeks, who were also very ethnocentric. Uh, but nothing, uh, nothing like this, uh, no, nothing like the ideological struggle of the U.S. and Russia, it uh, didn't have that quite fineness. It was more or less based simply upon uh, we don't like those guys because they wear trousers and they use bear grease on their hair and stuff like that. Yes, question. Is, is the loss of freedom uh, pretty typical of all the inflation throughout history? Um, I'm, I'm only a specialist in, in, in a few areas. I will say this, that uh, in Roman history, it certainly is, because remember that the final Rome had already gone through a, a dramatic transformation in the days of the late Republic in the fir first and second century before Christ. And in that period, again, uh, extensive wars 
and civil wars in particular between various factions of the Roman army, Rome became militarized, militarized state, uh, those wars led to a collapse of the republican coinage. And uh, Augustus's uh, issuance of a whole new coinage was based upon his bringing about a state of peace at the price, of course, of the death of the republic. And uh, so the Augustan coinage that I've described, its destruction 200 years later, was itself instituted as a reform having uh, to replace the republican coinage, which had been destroyed by inflation. So I would think, uh, I would think a loss of freedom is almost inevitable in these, whenever you get a combination of war and, uh, and uh, monetary inflation. Uh, you can certainly see it in the United States because they're passing more and more restrictions and more penalizing laws to collect the tax. It's pretty obvious. Yeah, you especially see it when the government that has instituted the inflation doesn't take steps to get at the root cause of it to cure the inflation, but instead tries to do uh, minor and circumferential things to affect the inflation. So clearly then you'll have a loss of freedom. Seen that historically, we've seen it in the United States, as you mentioned. This question. Thank you, uh, Professor Peden. I, I know that a gathering like this uh, is it, pretty risky to say anything good about politicians, and I, I quite agree with your conclusion. And, and I certainly enjoyed your presentation, but it worries me a little bit how, in terms of what one of the questioners asked: uh, How are we going to? Do you have any suggestions how we get from here to there? And I wonder if if in your research, if you found any indication that uh, in, in the olden days that there was an attempt to bastardize the language like we're doing today. For example, the, the monitors are, have a quite different idea about the meaning of the word inflation, and I don't mean to be overly simplistic, but if you're going to communicate with the politicians, you've got to be pretty simple-minded. And yeah. with that being the case, it, it worries me because it, as I observe this veil of tears, uh, it occurs to me that we really are getting representative government, and that's what scares me to death. And I just wondered if you see they're bastardizing the language today with the word inflation, that we don't seem to be able to distinguish the difference between price inflation and money inflation to no, over That's an interesting question. Well, uh, changes in language, um, is an, there is one or two interesting aspects. For example, in the rabbinical sources, uh, which have been uh, reviewed recently by a... Uh, Israeli scholar uh, uh, Daniel Sperber in a series of books on Roman Palestine. Uh, he notices that uh, in the first and second centuries, the rabbis refer to uh, a, a coin called the mena, and it clearly means uh, one denarius. Uh, in the third century, they're still using the word mena, but it now means a hundred denarii. In other words, the word remains the same, but its connotation has changed. Likewise, when they use the word denarius in their sources in the first century, they mean it a, a silver coin. When they uh, want to refer to the gold coin, they call it a gold denarius. Okay? By the third century, whenever they use the word denar or denarius, uh, it always means a gold coin. So there's been a, a shift. The words are the same, but there's been a total shift in the content. 